a great pleasure, Cliff, to have met you again after many years. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, to have a chance to talk to you about some of your um, writing and life. Um, you're in many ways one of the most reflective, um, <coughs> reflecting of anthropologists, so this is a particular uh, opportunity to see what imprint the elephant has left behind um, now that it's moved on. Um, I was wondering, what, when were you born? What the other day? I was born in 1926 in San Francisco. Mm. Uh, my parents were divorced when, when I was be before I was three, mm. and I was sent off to live north of San Francisco in the countryside uh, with a unrelated woman of about 60 or so at the time, I guess she was, a uh, woman I call Nana. And, I, and it was in, uh, in Marin County. Now, Marin County now is a very fancy place, but at that time, it was, this was the depth of the Depression. Uh, they were, it was a little place in the hills called Woodacre, of all places, and, and it had two or three hundred people. And I lived a very isolated life. I went to a two-room schoolhouse, uh, never went anywhere, did much of anything until, until the war came, which was then, that would have been 15 years or so, 16 years on. And then I joined as soon as I could, actually. I graduated my school and I, at the age of 17 and went into the Navy and then ended up in the Pacific. And when I came back, uh, left California more or less permanent. I mean, I've been back and forth, but I left it as, as home. And so there's a kind of cleavage in my life that's rather striking to most people when they hear it. It's striking to me, actually. The, the first 17 years or so were sort of living an isolate rural life in the depths of the depression. We were poor, but we, we, we had enough to eat and we were warm enough, so it wasn't really that bad. But it, was, it wasn't as bad as many people had, and there was a lot. But we just lived on, and um, and then then I lived. A, since then, I've lived a very cosmopolitan life. I've always thought, you know, I lived in a, I lived in a very very rural atmosphere. I mean, it was very very countryside. But I was urban from the start. Now I don't know that you know we, what what we would say about that. But I feel that I always was. So once I got out and got east, that's where I felt I belonged, and or at least where I wanted to be. And I didn't want to go back I, because of the complexities of my family. Not only my parents are divorced, everybody in the whole damn family was divorced. It was a mess, but anyway. So I left. Right. Not much happened. That's the thing. There was a period in which nothing really happened. It's a funny kind of... I had, it was a rural teacher? countryside life, and you know, and I did things and stuff, but nothing... There was no teacher who... Yeah. There were teachers who were always my salvation. Um, uh, I was, if I may say, a smart kid, right? So, and this is a countryside where even the kids who were smart weren't smart. I mean, they weren't supposed to be, so they didn't become, you know, some of them had good brains, but they didn't. But I was an intellectual to start with. Uh, I, was, I was alone, I was isolated, I read an enormous amount. And uh, yes, uh, two teachers, one in, in elementary school, who thought I was a cat's pajamas and really gave me, taught me to learn how to do things, read things and do things, get involved, whom I still remember with great warmth. I have a senior, she's dead now, certainly, but I'm in mean, and then later on, even more importantly, a high school teacher, whom I do mention, I think, in something I've written, uh, a man named Laura Santardi, who had been a merchant seaman and was a leftist. This was the time of California, of course, where the left labor unions were, this was the time of Harry Bridges. My grandfather was a labor union printer. I mean, it was all, we were all connected with that kind of thing, indirectly. My father was not, he was a civil servant, but the others were. Anyway, uh, Laura Santardi was, a, was an ex, well, not an ex-radical. He's a radical, but he was now teaching high school. And, uh, uh, and he had a tremendous influence on it. In fact, it was he who, after I came back from, I would, while I was in high school, I, I, I was the editor of the high school newspaper. Or I worked up to the be editor of the high school newspaper. And he was the, the faculty advisor. And, some, we had, and he, he also had a tremendous influence on my reading. I wanted to be a writer and a novelist. Uh, what age did you want to be a writer? Very young. Uh, as soon as I knew there was such a thing, I think. I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's diff I never wanted to be a fireman or anything like that. I didn't have that kind of thing that some people have. I always wanted to write, and I always admired writers from very early. And I certainly all, by the time I got to high school, I wanted to be a writer. And he encouraged that, and I, you know, and I, and I did write some. Um, later on, I edited a college literary magazine, and so on. So I, I, but anyway, Tardy had a tremendous influence on me. And when I went, as I say, I went to the Navy and 
headed toward Japan to invade it, but the bomb was dropped. We were just about to get there as we turned around and came back. Um, I uh, went to him and said, you know, what do I do now? And I had never thought of going to college because we were poor. I mean, I, not poor, or at least not well off. I was, in those days, everybody didn't go to college. And I, I hadn't thought that I would go. Uh, I expected to work on a telephone company or something, which is what everybody did, or something like that. And he said, well, why don't you... And I had the GI Bill. That was the big... Do you, you know what the GI Bill is, I guess, for not American audience? wants to explain that there was this enormous socialist enterprise in the United States in which any ex-GI, ex-serviceman uh, had uh, the time served plus a year, tuition, books, uh, a living expense. I mean, it was just... The, the, and anywhere you wanted to go um, that you could get in. And I said, I, he said, well, you've got this. Why don't you take it? And, 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 and I said, well, I don't know where to go to college. Um, I, I didn't really want to go to Berkeley because I didn't want to stay in California. Um, and he said, well, this is sort of, again, left-wing college, uh, experimental college in Ohio called Antioch, where they have this work-study program. You work half-time, you study half-time. And it's a, it's a kind of, it was always a very radical place for uh, ex-radicals teaching there and so on, or not always ex, but anyway, they're there. And I said, okay, and so I applied. Never applied anywhere else. Didn't think of the notion that you could, you know, that you apply and not get in, but I did, and went on. So he had that, in. he sent me there, and he formed my sort of sense of self as a literary figure, and as a, as a and politically he did too, and socially. And so, uh, uh, yeah, he was an extraordinary man. Uh, so between my grammar school principal, elementary school principal, and my high school English teacher, and some other teachers in high school also had some influence on me. He wasn't alone, but he was way, way ahead, the most influential. Sounds as if your parents didn't have much influence on you. No. Um, Except in a negative way. Yeah, it was negative. I don't, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not just stumbling for it because I don't know how to put it. They, I, they had a non-influence. Uh, uh, my father had to be sort of almost forced to pay for my upkeep. Uh, and they they were rather neglected. My mother tried uh, sometimes, but I was I I saw my mother maybe once a year. I saw my father maybe once every two years. Um, neither of them wanted to bother with me. Uh, um, I don't want to. Uh, call them. Later on, my mother at least tried. I mean, she made an effort sometimes, but it wasn't very effective. Uh, my father just was a was a detached character and uh, wasn't hostile. I mean, uh, I ended up. Uh, so to speak, burying both of them because I had to go back when they died and so on, which wasn't so long ago. Um, they lived very long. But no, they were, they were just absent. They just, they shouldn't have been parents. I mean, they weren't hostile. I, I don't, that, not at all. I mean, they, um, but they were certainly neglectful and, uh, and I was just sort of something that they wanted to send off to the countryside and forget that ever happened. You were the only child. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they got divorced. Uh, they had been married only a few years and had me and got divorced. I mean, that was their marriage. They both remarried. Both remarried well, actually, I must say. They didn't have any children but they, in the second marriages, but they both, I liked both my stepfather and my stepmother a good deal, actually. They, they were very nice people. But, uh, uh, and I had some relation to my grandfather, who was this, I said, Union printer on the, on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. But it, uh, it, I mean, but that was about it. And essentially, Family was something for me by the time I got back in the 40s to get far away from. <laughs> anyway, the whole family was like that. I mean, it was, it was, it was multiplied. On, on the war service, um, did you learn Japanese? Or? No, I didn't do that. I, what I did do was, oddly enough, it will surprise you here, I was an electronic technician. Mm. Um, uh, it's odd because I had, I had wanted to... I. He had what we call smiling C's, which were classification officers. They had a C on, they were always smiling. So we called it. They, they decided where you went in the Navy. So after going to boot camp, I had to go through boot camp twice because I got scarlet fever in the middle. So at last, I was in Farragut, Idaho, in the depth of snow. I'd never seen snow. Anyway, I got through all that, finally. And, I, and they had this program where, by if you volunteered, you could be, because the Navy, for reasons we didn't know, needed to go into supply the medical corps for the Marine Corps that you could do that because it was a non-combatant role, you could volunteer for it. Um, if I did, I did volunteer for it and uh, was about to go into it, um, then uh, we, in which case I would be dead. I mean, there's no, I would have gone to Iwo Jima I mean, as, as a hospital corpsman, which is not a, the greatest idea in the world. 
Anyway, so I did that, and but then, uh, um, alas, they gave me an, uh, they gave IQ tests, and I scored very high on the IQ test, and I went back to see the Smiling Sea, and he said, "You're not going to be a middle corpsman; you're going to be an electronic technician," because they had very, you know, they needed people. So I had the, the it was the longest and most technical training for it under for non non. Oh, I was just an ordinary student. Um, Later was a petty officer, and that's all. And um, so I went for three months to Chicago, a month someplace, then three months to Chicago, and then uh, the three, three or four months to Gulfport, Mississippi, and seven months at Treasure Island in San Francisco. And I repair, I wasn't a radar operator, I was a radar repairman. Uh, and then I was, so that's, I became a, a technician, a petty officer, third class or second, eventually. And I oh, served on a, a heavy cruiser, a brand new heavy cruiser called the St. Paul, sister ship of the Indianapolis, which was famously sunk uh, at this, while we were at sea, so it was nervous making. Uh, and we were sailing, as I say, toward Japan. I don't know whether we were going to, I thought at that time that we were headed toward Tokyo Bay, but apparently we were headed not. We were headed toward the south. The invasion was to come from the south. In any case, one day there's this announcement on the loudspeakers that uh, a mystery weapon or something that, you know, uh, the ultimate, they didn't say it was an A-bomb at those days, but some some final bomb had been dropped, um, and then it was shortly followed by the notion that uh, this is the first we had heard of anything like this, uh, that uh, the, you know, the Trojan War will not take place. I mean, we weren't going to go in there. And uh, so we sailed around a bit and then turned around and went home, and then all the people who were not regular uh, uh, Navy people were discharged. I mean, so I got off and went back to San Francisco. and. Spent about oh, four or five months wandering around. Also at the government's expense, they had to also f give you fifty dollars a week for forty-two weeks until you sort of readjusted yourself to civilian existence. And I wrote then. I spent a good deal of time. I lived in San Francisco in an apartment and uh, wrote short stories and started a novel and various things. And then Tardy said, "Well, you know, go go to that's it." <laughs> when you went to your to uh, Ohio mm. University. Um, were there any teachers there, again, who... Oh, well, there, there was a tremendously shipping teacher. I've dedicated books to them and so on. I've even written about one of them, a man named George Geiger, who was John Dewey's last graduate student. Um, he was also the backup to uh, Lou Gehrig on the Columbia baseball team, which meant he never played. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was an extraordinary man. Uh, he taught philosophy. I majored first in literature and then shifted to philosophy, mainly because in philosophy you could do almost anything you wanted. But I did both. Um, and there were a number of persons who were important, but Geiger was absolutely shaping in my life. Uh, uh, he's a man who made me into a kind of intellectual rather than estate. I mean, I, I got, he was very, uh, he's sort of known. He's not famous by any means, and he never will be, but he, he, was, he was more than just an ordinary philosopher. He, people didn't know of him, and he wrote stuff. Anyway, and it was he who finally, after four years working with him uh, and doing things, who said I should go and be an anthropologist. And that was, again, a very, I didn't know what to do with it. I had majored under, as an undergraduate in philosophy and literature, written papers on uh, Emily Dickinson, on Hawthorne, on George Herbert Mead, on uh, Spinoza, Spinoza, and so on, but not exactly a great current direction of there. I was very much interested, interested then in new criticism and things of that sort. I edited a literary magazine, you know, same old story. I, 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 and I wrote. Um, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, by then I was married to Hilly. I, mean, I met her there and married her there. And she was also, she was an English major and she didn't know what to do with either. I mean, neither one of us knew what to do. And I was out of the GI Bill and Geiger had this um, American Council learned says, I've had a lucky life, as you'll see. I mean, it just everything turns up roses for me somehow. Anyway, he had this very lush grant that he, the American Council of Learned Societies, which is a covering organization uh, uh, in the United States, uh, still goes on, still does very good work, um, had this grant program where in each small college, in the, well, I mean, not only small ones, but small ones were the ones where it really counted, as Antioch was. Antioch only had about 1,000 students, and half of them weren't there half the time, so it was very small, in a very small little Ohio town. Again, rural, huh? but, I, it, but the place is very urban. It's all full of urban type. Anyway, uh, in each uh, small, small co or each college, they gave, they took one professor and said, "You give this to anybody you want." 
So Gardner gave it to me. And I didn't know what to do with it. And he says, well, why don't you try anthropology? And so I had never studied it, read it, or heard about it. Well, I had read Benedict, I think, maybe. I'm not even sure, but I think I did. But I certainly didn't know much about anthropology or have any particular interest in it. And, uh, but the reason he said that was because he had been in contact with Clyde Clunkone. Well, how that happened, I don't know. Met him somewhere, I guess. And uh, uh, they were just starting the social relations department at Harvard. Clunkone, Parsons, Talker Parsons, uh, Sam Stauffer, Harry Murray, Gordon Allport, that, that lot, right? That famous enterprise. Um, and he said, why don't you think about going there? And I said, well, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I, you know I, so I went out and tried to find out what anthropology was a bit. Uh, and then I had a friend, at, uh, uh, a woman at, uh, whom I knew at uh, Antioch, who had, was working for Margaret Mead. Margaret had, was up in that tower, that famous tower in the, in the American Museum of Natural History, which she, and she had, a, there really was a harem. There were women, young women working for her. Uh, and they were all very loyal to her. Very, uh, and they, she said, well, I can get you an interview with Margaret Mead. And, I, and of course, by that, Hilly and I were both involved in this. And, I, and there was enough on this grant to f finance both of us, which is extraordinary for graduate school. So um, even at that time, I mean, now it would be under the, out, of, out, of this, out of the question. But anyway, uh, that was leisure times right after the war. So I went, so we went off to see Margaret. And she never, she didn't know who we were from Adam. I mean, uh, and she spent two or three hours talking to us, showing us her, her field notes. Field notes of Bali, actually, though they were very strange field notes. They were totally behavioristic. You know, uh, Gusti stands up for two minutes, walks 30 feet left, sits down for a minute and a half, walk. You know, I mean, they were just incredible, pages and pages of this sort of stuff that she had done with Gregory, I guess, partly to go along with the camera yeah, stuff. But it was, it was anyway, but she, t uh, but she was very enthusiastic, and she said, you know, great, become, do become anthropologist. So we did, and, and we said, I uh, then went, of course, to Harvard, we applied to Harvard, we both applied. There were only six people allowed in this year in the, in the anthropology section, and Hilly and I both got in, and the rest is, I don't know, history or something. Just as we pass people by, because mm. we may not come back to them, oh, sure. it's, it's nice to, there's anything more to be said about them as we go past. So the first major anthropological figure we've met is um, Margaret Mead. Uh, there are, as you know, quite strong. Well, there people. always were, yeah. <laughs> um, but your impression, certainly at the beginning, was positive. Did it continue positive? Oh, yeah. She was, uh, to me, she, I mean, I can see why people get furious at her. She made people furious. I mean, that, and did it not without motivation, not without malice. Uh, but she was always extremely kind to me um, and always very nice to me uh, and to Hilly, to both of us. She, she, the thing about Margaret is that I, she didn't have trouble with younger people. She was very good with younger people. But she had trouble with peers, I mean, and, and superiors. <laughs> but if they, she, I don't think she thought there were any superiors. But peers, she had trouble with. But she didn't. But she was very good, good with um, with younger people. Oh, I don't. Again, I won't want like a total generalization. But I know a number of younger people who were younger when she was not younger, when she was already established. Who, and the people who worked with her and so on. Those those women. Uh, later on, uh, and we stayed friends with her. I didn't see her often, and I didn't study with her. And I and I'm not. I don't consider myself a follower particularly. I'm mean, not a, not a non-follower, but I just didn't really study with her that much. Uh, uh, later on, Hilly and I were in, and she sort of maintained referred to us in Blackberry Winter. She referred to us as her friends of hers, younger friends of hers, among other people. I mean. We were in uh, Bali. This was in 1957. This far went far along, right? I'm already. We already I'm already a real, real, real I've been out there for a year living in this uh, little town. And there was this um, cremation, these huge celebrations that the Balinese have to bury the dead, there's thousands of people and so on. But it wasn't in the town, it was down at the coast in a very remote area. And then you could, there was no road, you had to walk in. And we had been down there for about a week, and it's dust and heat and thousands of people, and they have this crazy laughing going on. It's a, it's a really discombobulating situation. So Hilly is up at the, at the um, palace where they cut a hole in the wall to take the body out. It was that end of things. Then they carry it for about a half a mile down to the burning ground. Now, I'm at the burning ground, so we're trying to cover this thing, you know, like a couple of reporters. I do think anthropologists would rather like covering news stories anyway, but this is what this was. So I'm standing there, and I've been, this, I've been out there for four or five days without getting much sleep and really in the heat and the dust. All of a sudden, the 
the dust sort of parts, and there standing leaning on her famous crotchety stick is Margaret. And I looked at her, and I, the first thing I say to myself is, is she real? If you're going to go crazy in the field, this is how an anthropologist is going to go crazy in the field. So I rush up back to, not to Margaret, but back up to Hilly and said, you're not going to believe this. You've got, I've got to come. i got to need a reality check. <laughs> Margaret seems to be standing down there. So we went down and saw her. She, had, she was on one of her great trips, going to India, I think, and just had stopped in Bali. Well, why not? Found out where we had been, went to our, to our uh, little town, found that we weren't there, but we were way out in this remote place hired a car, walked in on her notoriously terrible legs. She had these ankles, you know, she was carried in out of, she talks about being carried in out of like a pig out of uh, New Guinea. But she was still, couldn't, and she walked on the stick. She walked in and she said, I know anthropologist, and then we went up to her, we, the deed was she and we were sane, and, I, and she was palpable. And uh, she said, I know anthropologists don't like other anthropologists and treat upon that field side, and I'm not trying to do that. I came here because I was passing through and I, Partly I want to see you, but also I have a friend of old standing, a, a, a fairly rather than rather well known, locally well known, not locally anywhere. Well, there's a Japanese uh, art salesman, no, you know, you know a museum keeper. Uh, what do you call him? A guy a gallery, yeah, um, named Jimmy Pandy, whom I had not met. And she said, "I'd like you to come to dinner in a couple of days and meet this man, and it would be good for you to meet him." And indeed it would. We were there, and so that was it. That's the story. And two days later, we did, and on. And, beautiful beach at Sonora with Margaret. So the answer to your question, she was always extremely kind to me, so I'm never going to say a negative word about her. I can understand why she drives some people crazy. That is, you know, she was, she could be difficult, all right, but she was never difficult with me. She was always very nice to me, and, and uh, from, I remember with great warmth. Apart from the difficulty, though, uh, in a recent interview, I heard a lot about the Freeman oh, well. controversy, and uh, I don't know whether as well as the difficulty there, there were in few, she was um, alleged to have um, manipulated her data and made up quite a bit. Um. Well, I don't know. I, of course, have no way to know that. Uh, I, I have anecdotes about that, too. I went to, I went to um, Australia just 10 years ago or so for, to the Manny Center for a summer. I give a t general talk, and, and some guy stands up in the audience and starts asking me questions about why American anthropologists, I, the talk was not on American anthropology, it was on, I can't remember what it was on, but it had nothing, to, the question had nothing to do with the subject matter of the talk. Well, it was Derek, and he kept asking his questions, and, and he kept, while I was there, he sort of kept pursuing me, trying to get me to say something about negative about Margaret, or about American anthropology, and why we're all cultural relativists, and, and I just, my reply was, no, we're not all cultural, you know, I didn't know what else to say. Uh, and, and, and I don't know if you knew Derek, but he, he, he was in and out of phase. I mean, he wasn't always off his head. He was sometimes off his head. I mean, I think he just was. Everybody says he was. And as far as I can see, I don't, didn't know him well enough that I could make a diagnosis of what was wrong with him. But he did behave rather oddly. There are millions of stories you've heard. But as from Nippy today, no, I think, uh, I, I don't know whether she did or didn't. Uh, I, I, I thought that it was, I guess my loyalty to Margaret came out in the fact that I felt it was rather cowardly of him to wait till she died. That, that if you're going to take on Margaret, you ought to take her on. And, uh, and he could have done that. He, I, don't, I really do not believe that he could not have done it before she died. And then he would have been in for a struggle, and, and it would have been a fair fight. What the answer to the question is, certainly coming to age of Samoa is, is, a, is, a, is not a great book, it's, but it's, she's 26, it's early, it's 1926, she's 26, it's the beginning of things, so I tend to be a little bit more... Uh, a little bit less censorious, and some people I know in Samoa say it's not all wrong and so on, but it, that it's light and superficial and she may have been, that I don't really know, and I have no, uh, I don't have any inside story on that. I never talked to Margaret about it. Well, I never talked to her about Freeman, because Freeman didn't appear on the scene until she was dead. He then, uh, he kept writing to me. I, he, the other thing, he was, he was a strange man, so I never, he, while I was at, in Australia, he kept sending me postcards with funny things on them, not few odd statements on them. I never responded because I didn't want to get involved with this man. I didn't want to be, I never want to be part of somebody else's delusory, it's a delusional system. I just figured, I'm not involved in this. I didn't work in Samoa and I like Margaret personally, but this is, and I never did. But, and even when he did this, even from a distance, I get letters from him and so on, trying to get me involved and so on. Why it was, why it was we were all conspiring to do something to him. And I wasn't conspiring at all. I wasn't doing anything. But, um, on the issue itself, uh, there would be people better placed to decide what it was. Uh, um, 
I don't, I don't think Camino Small is a great book, but it, it, for, 20, for a 26-year-old woman in 1926, it's not a bad book. It's a rather interesting, but maybe not a good anthropology book. Coming back to Harvard, um, and uh, another figure there, one of the earliest books I ever read in anthropology was Clyde Crookham's Mirror for Man, and yes. also another witchcraft. Mm. Um, he, from a recent uh, interview I've done, he appears to be quite an eccentric character. Florence was eccentric too. Yes. Um, is there any sort of anecdotes or pen portraits or Well, my relationships with him were, are really very complicated. Um, he was he was a tortured man. I, I think that's something that people really don't know and I don't want to I don't know enough. He he really was was he was yes difficult. I got caught between him and Talkett Parsons in a kind of crossfire in which he publicly lambasted me, and it was very, as I went on, he was a graduate student. So one of these were graduate students get caught between two professors. And it was quite, as, on the other hand, every time it push came to shove, Cloud supported me. I mean, he's the reason I got the job at Berkeley. He's the reason I did it, got the, went to Indonesia and so on. So I have no real resentments. My relationships to him, I remember with, with, with a certain amount of agony. I mean, I really didn't, I, but he was tortured. I don't want to get. Fr I have views about that, but I don't. Is, uh, that's not the sort of thing. East European. It's a strange name. Is it? Was he East European? No, he wasn't. Well, I don't know. He was. He's no. He's very American. I mean, he may. Uh, his the Cluckone is not his own name. He, that's the other thing. He, he, he was adopted. Uh, he grew up in Iowa. Uh, his parents, I guess, died. He was adopted by the Cluckones. Um, he was sick all his life. He had. Uh, our trouble from very early on was sent to the Southwest. That's where I got to become a, a, a Navajo specialist. Uh, I'm, uh, because I, I, I just want to be careful here because, but he was he was a conflicted, deeply conflicted man. He was a wild co warrior, and you know he ran the Russian Research Center. Um, his son, as you may have known, that got in trouble for. Actually, well, she shot a woman by out of a window, supposedly accidentally, but who knows? Anyway, that so their story and Florence was also she was she had an odd disease of some sort too. Uh, Florence was my wife's thesis director. She got along with her all right, uh, and I had no trouble with Florence particularly. But but they were they drank heavily. I mean, I, I don't again. I don't want to get too personal because it's not right to do that. But but I think it's fair enough to say that they were not a happy crew. Uh, and on the other hand, it must be said that Clyde really supported me. He really did think I was a, going to do some good work and he was, he was hard to deal with personally, very, very hard to deal with. He played favorites uh, shamelessly, I mean, in an you know, open way, played people off against each other. I mean, there's nothing new about that. You've that. I mean, I won't say who would, but you know, you, uh, but he was not a simple man. Uh, but I, uh, I feel, uh, despite what I just seem to be saying, uh, I yeah. feel gratitude toward him. Yes, I feel warmly toward him, even though it was painful. It one, there's been occasions where it was just, uh, just what, awful. What about the other um, magnet in the other direction, Tolkott Parsons? Well, Tolkott said, all the other direction. Tolkott was a bunny. I mean, he, he, nobody. I mean, uh, he, uh, people have usually overemphasized Tolkott's influence on me, which I can't. Uh, when toward the end of his life, Tolkien was attacked from all sides, and I personally took a resolution that I'm not going to do that because he had been very good to me, also. Though I myself never was, you know, never really followed his line of thought. And so, on. but Tolkien was a very benevolent character. Um, he was a very nice man, very easy, uh, very strange, a little bit. I don't mean this as a, as a clinical one, but schizoid. You know, he was a little removed, and he didn't quite know what was going on in Tolkien's big dome, and so on. But. Uh, and he had these elaborate schemes and so on. And I, I taught a course with him once, and enjoyed it. And, uh, and he was very, very good to me. And uh, so I've always taken a resolution that I wasn't going to join in this, uh, even though I think I'm off, my work is often over assimilated to that. But that, that's another long story. We can talk about that later if you want. But Tonkin personally was benevolent. And I think one thing to say about, should, one should remember about Tonkin is the range of, of really good students he produced. David Schneider. Um, Bob Bella, that one, you know, uh, 
I mean, I guess, but other people, uh, you don't know, maybe it's Joe Berger. I don't know. Okay, he had an enormous range of, of from, from infrared to ultraviolet, positive, it's all kind. Uh, um, Rene Fox, who's probably the main, main uh, medical sociologist, a number of major figures uh, now. So the, the image of him as a, some sort of a intellectual tyrant is all wrong. I mean, he, it's true, you couldn't, you couldn't budge him about it. The thing about talking is he had these things, um, these wow. enormous schemes. So whenever you tried to disagree with him, he would find a slot for you, and you would say, I would say, Tucker, no, we're in a disagreement. No, I know it fits over here. I mean, you're <laughs> under the eyes and the R's, and, and never could get to Tucker that, no, on Tucker, on this, you and I are not of one mind. But he, he felt he could absorb every, he, he had a Hegelian mind. It was all going to be interpreted into the system. So it, you felt like you were floundering around in a, in a, in a sea of stuff. Uh, but he was a warm man and a very intelligent man, and, and I learned an enormous amount from him. The thing is, you don't learn from talking by learning the system. You learn from going, someday somebody will do an editing job on Parsons and take out the parts that are really valuable, because some, some of the stuff that's now supposed to be very avant-garde, about power, about status, he had years ago. It's there, but it's buried under 16 you know, pages of something else. So. Uh, but uh, and as I say, he and, and more on I think Clyde's side, but though I don't really know the inside stories of this, had a kind of by the, after a while there was a great tension, and I got caught between it because I was working a little bit with Talker, though I was mainly uh, under under Clyde, and uh, and that led to to me getting uh, sort of fired up from both sides. Well, though Talker was never he never bothered, he just. He was, he was very influenced, obviously, in many ways he was the translator and publicizer of Max Weber. Well, that is where he did have influence on him. You acknowledge a that's very right. large influence of Weber. And that's right, and it's also, also through him. I never heard of Weber until I, till I met Talkett. Mm. Was Weber, would you say he is the classical figure who has influenced you most in, in anthropology, classical sociologist? Oh, so far and away, yes, mm. still does. Yes, very much so. And you know, there's always this sort of New Testament, Old Testament view of Weber. I mean, there's Parsons, the, sort of the New Testament reader, and I got it, the New Testament version, that's true. Uh, uh, but then later on also tried to read Weber directly in German and so on, and, which I didn't, couldn't originally, but I now can now. And, and, uh, but Weber, yes, is, I still consider myself uh, fundamentally a Weberian, yes, very much so. Anyone else? I mean, recur you talked about. Um Oh, there's an enormous number of people who've had influence on me. Money, Ricoeur, yes, all kinds of people who are not known. Kenneth Burke, um, who's a new, new critic, various kinds of philosophers, and Wittgenstein, enormously. I mean, that's a long story, but that is self, not self-discovered, but it's self, I didn't get it for any teacher directly. Um, uh, Marx at all? Not so much. Uh, you know, I guess if you get sort of a Weber, you get to be a little bit skeptical of Marx. So no, I've always been sort of skeptical of Marx uh, and, and critical. Um, not really. No, I, I, you know, I've read Marx and I had some influence, but uh, on that line, I'm more Weber. And then the other figure, of course, is Durkheim, whom I've always been had a arm's length relationship to. I, you know, I admire him in some ways, but I really don't like it in some other ways. So, um, of course, again, with Tonkin, he was going to bring all these together, Marx and Durkheim and Pareto and, and Weber, all one big happy family, uh, <laughs> all, all, all with parsnip names. And uh, uh, again, he was a great, uh, he was a very optimistic, Tonkin was a very optimistic character, and he had this sort of and I didn't have that. I tend to be a fox, not a hedgehog, very much of a fox. And he was the ultimate hedgehog. I'm a, a, a tremendous, well, Isaiah Berlin had influence on me too. Isaiah was, was, it was Isaiah was responsible for me coming to Oxford that year and so on. Um, so uh, there's an enormous number of people who've had influence, I mean intellectual figures of influence. But Weber is certainly it. And I think if you go the Weber way rather than either the Marx or Durkheim way, it's a natural way for a fox to go. Uh, and. Uh, and I, uh, that I am radically a fox. I, I'm not a what about the earlier great tradition of American anthropology? Kroeber, Boaz, uh, Linton, Lowry, these people, did any of them? Well, I, kn I knew many of them, but 
No, I th Benedict had a big influence on me. I, I think uh, I like because she brought an aesthetic approach to anthropology, which I. Um, Did you know Robert Lowy? Yeah, I knew Robert Lowy. I, uh, in fact, he was partly, I think, responsible for me for coming to, to Berkeley. I had met him uh, when he came to talk. I didn't know him that well, but I met him when he came to talk at Harvard, and I was head of the speakers, student speakers thing, and I, so I had had him for a day and so on. And he was one who brought me to Berkeley when I was, before I went there, I, I went to the field in between and so on. And I saw him, and then when I got back, he was dead, alas. But uh, yeah, I did know Robert Lowe. I, I have a huge respect for him. I like mm. his work enormously. Was he a nice man as well? Or? Yeah, I, uh, mine's the other way around. His work has not had much impact on me. I, uh, the crow bores me, but <laughs> uh, that's just me. But I mean, um, but as a man, he was, uh, yes. Again, I don't want to claim I knew him that well, but he was a very fine person. Kober I knew because when I went to Harvard, though I didn't meet him then, Kober and Klockham were doing that culture book, and I was a research assistant on it. I mean, I had a comment. And then later when I was at Berkeley, Kober was living, he was then retired, in fact, not too long from death, up, living up in the hills. And when I left, he called me up, and we had a long discussion about why I was leaving Berkeley after only a year going to uh, Years, but I mean, only one year there to go to Chicago, and he was very nice, very well. But that's all I know of him. I mean, the relationship was formal but pleasant. I mean, certainly he was. He wanted me to stay, but he did. He said, you know, I can understand why you might want to go. And so, I, uh, who else? I knew. I met Linton once or twice when he talked at, at Harvard. Clark knew all these people, so we, we got to meet them all, uh, one way or another. But I can't say I knew Linton. Uh, uh, I admired, of course, Sapir enormously, who was influential, but never met him. Uh, Sapir has had a, had a big influence earlier on. And that's through Klein, Sapir and Benedict and so on. That whole notion of mean is important. Uh, whatever the shortcomings of some of the work is still, you know, that. And Boaz, of course, was dead before I came into the field, so I didn't have any relation to Boaz. But, and, and, and I guess when I first came in, there was, there was a feeling in the air, which was quite wrong, that Boaz was you know, well, that he was all about fish recipes, and so you know that he was the uh, you know the ultimate, the ultimate data gatherer, which isn't correct actually. He was a much deeper thinker than that, but it took a while, and George talking a few other people before we understood that. So I think I shared the cliche, not out of reading him much. I had read Primitive Man and Art, whatever it's called, and some others. But I had the general yes that he was he, you know he was about fish hooks and so on and I and my interest in fish hooks was limited. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, returning to your uh, PhD work, you, mm -hmm. you enrolled and uh, how was it that you came to start your work in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. Well, everything by the time this is over, you're going to feel that my life is a continual chance of lucky breaks, but it's true. I, I, well, you, Hilly and I were studying at Harvard and study, working very hard for two years at Harvard. You worked extremely hard. I didn't do anything but study. But, and we were thinking vaguely, if you worked, was you know, was, was a was a destiny. You had <laughs> it was going to happen. That was a, those days. It was a rita passage. There was no question, and it had to be out of the United States, another language. I mean, there was no. It, that's no longer the case, alas, in my view. But whatever that's, for that, I suppose. But anyway. I didn't know what I was, I thought, well, vaguely, I might go to, go to Brazil, but that was just, you know, with it's there. So I'm walking across um, the Harvard Yard one day, and Doug Oliver, an anthropologist, teaching at Prebody, comes up to me and says, well, we have this um, group project that's going to Java for two years, or three years, whatever it was, and we need somebody to study kinship and somebody to study religion. Would you and your wife be willing to do this? And I said, essentially, there's not the quotation, but I said, yes, where is Indonesia? You know, I mean, <laughs> I had never thought of it, heard of it. Uh, it was extremely well financed. Those were the days when things were well financed. Ford Foundation was financing it. And we had, uh, so I joined the group. There were eight of us, I think, to start. Only about five I managed to make up the field. There's some four or five. Um, eight or nine to start. Um, and we had language training every weekend, for the whole weekend, oral, oral, with a with this Dian, who was then the leading Malayo Polynesian linguist, uh, and then later on Rufus, Rufus Hendon, who is now the leading the Malayo Polynesian linguist. So we, uh, so I said, if we studied that language for a year, then went off to Java. But it was just, 
you know, the finger of God. I mean, it had no, uh, now again, it was Clyde's doing. I mean, Clyde was, Clyde had organized this and he had said, Oliver, go get those kids. I mean, uh, so that's why, again, I am very positive about Clyde, even though my personal relationships with him were not the happy ones. But he was very good to me. And uh, uh, so uh, that's how it happened. What about that famous moment as you step onto the beach in, as it were, the Trobriands, and your first impressions as you arrive in Indonesia? Can you remember that? And well, I remember that very vividly because we got, I went to Holland for two or three months before I went to learn Dutch, uh, to improve my Dutch reading ability and to learn to speak a bit, but mainly to read it and to meet some, some Dutch scholars, half of whom would talk to me and half of whom wouldn't because that was the time when they thought America was stealing their empire. But anyway, never mind that. And some, some of them were very, very kind to me. So anyway, I, worked, I lived in, 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 in Leiden for, uh, for quite a while, three or four months. Then got on a ship with all of his scholars. The rest came by later. Hilly too was in Leiden. We went, then went on a ship, uh, the Wulem Raus, which took a month to get to, uh, to Indonesia. The day before we arrived, the first uh, coup d'etat rebellion against the Sukarno government broke out, and uh, it was a narrow run thing. It's called October 17th or 17th? I think that's right. Um, and so we only arrived, there were tanks in the streets, and, uh, and we had some friends, um, we had already been Indonesian friends who were socialists, a member of the of Sharia Socialist Party. I know you, this is ancient history. For, for Indonesians know this history, but nobody else will. But anyway, Sharia was the, for one of the first prime ministers, was a UN resident. And I didn't know him particularly, but I did know Sujat Moko, who was his right hand man, a younger guy. So these socialists took us, especially Hill and I, and put us in a sort of safe house of socialists. It, was, it wasn't clear whether the socialists were all going to go to jail because they were the wrong side of this rebellion. It was very tense for three or four days. Uh, so I, I entered it, you know, at the first, at, at, a, at the right in the middle of a coup d'etat, or attempted one. It was eventually, Sukarno finally gave one of his famous performances in front of the parliament, and gave a speech and talked the people out of their, uh, to essentially talked them out of the, out of, out of the coup d'etat. And the socialists escaped without much damage, even though they were like, still was early on days. Later on, they had more hard time. So we came out of hiding. We didn't know for three or three days we were going to be arrested, whether we were going to be shot, or whether we were going to be thrown out of the country. And we didn't really know what was going on because we couldn't leave the house, essentially. And, and there were millions of rumors and a lot of socialist conspirators coming back. It was in the house of a man named Sam Udin, who's now forgotten, but who was a very important politician at that time, socialist politician. So yeah, I do remember putting my feet on the beach and then it then cleared up and we then went to live downtown and things were... Uh, there was a certain amount of chaos because your leader decided not to come with yeah, you. That's a different side. And you were sent off. You were going to be mm. sent off to some remote hotel somewhere. Well, right. Well, this is a little later now. Okay, so now we're. I'm, this I'm now on the beach or whatever. So we go to joke to the, Yes, that's what Douglas Oliver had organized the thing. Clyde, as they say, was the real entrepreneur behind it all and set it all up. But uh, Doug Oliver had gone to in, to. Um, Jogja, it's a central Java, in Palestine, where there was a new, the new Uni National University had just been founded. It was founded in the Sultan's Palace. Beautiful town. It's a beautiful town and a beautiful place at that time. I, I still remember it with extraordinary nostalgia. I can really get, get nostalgic about it. But the thing is, yes, just, I, I can't think, it was more than a week or two before we left. I, you know, I, memory is not certain, so, but it, it wasn't long before we left that he suddenly said he was, he had, some sort of mysterious illness, and he wasn't going to go. And of course, there were th he had made an arrangement. As I say, he had hardly told, he intimated a few of it, by and large, except that we were going to work with Gajamai, they were going to be students. It wasn't very clear what was going to go on. But there were three professors, nationalists, I mean, this is in the middle of the nationalist revolution, you know, who they're very, they're not trustful of <laughs> foreigners, I mean, especially of, you know, I, I remember the first thing one of the professors said to me, he, I said something, he was asking, I was still a kid, and he said, oh, what kind of your methodology? And I said, I'm a central empiricist. And he said, made some wisecrack about what's the difference between empiricist and imperialist. So we were off on a, on a, on a, on a right foot, though later he became very nice. There were these three professors, quite different characters, and they were going to, it had been set up, there were going to be about 30 students from Gajamata 
the university, the name of the university. Um, and of course, they were. This was all new, and they had had no. You know, these students were not students. I mean, they were students, but they hadn't. They really knew nothing. They didn't claim to. I must. They can't claim that. I mean, but they, they were going to learn from us. That was the idea. But we were going to have these thirty students. We were all going to go up and sit in a in a hotel, in a f old, old sort of watering hole, because uh, it's one of the few places in Java that doesn't grow rice. I mean, it's that high up. Uh, it's a rather beautiful place, and it, it's interesting in itself. But we were going to sit in this hotel, and the government officials were going to bring in people for us to interview in company with these students in a kind of mass interview situation. This is the way they, the adopt law tradition people in in Holland and way many Dutch anthropologists had worked. You know, they went and they, to a village. The village chief called in people and they asked them questions about, you know, what do you call your brother? What do you call your cross cousin? What do you do? You know, how what happens at marriage and so on. And you wrote it all down and you published it in books. Uh, well, this was about as antithetical to everything we've been trained. Participant observation was what we've been trained to do. The anthropologists is sort of one of them, and, you know, right in the middle of it, the sort of lone, the Malinowskian image. It couldn't be further from what we had in mind. And we simply weren't going to do this. I mean, very early on we thought this was ruinous. But in addition to that, of course, they suspected that Oliver is Not Coming was a plot of some sort, that he, that he really... Uh, had never attempted to keep his side of the bargain. Um, and they were deeply suspicious. They said, what do you know, you, you may come out here with this full Harvard professor, and you're going to do this marvelous thing, and you sent us a bunch of graduate students. I was almost the oldest. No, Ed Ryan was the oldest, but they were... Uh, so we did the best we could, for, and we, this was eight months of this, of our trying to get disentangled from that situation without a leader, without any status, and eventually, he said Rufus Hennon was great, but Rufus also at that time was not a major figure. I mean, he he was at least a, a faculty member, which is a little step up. But that he was a young, I think he may have been only an assistant professor or associate professor. Anyway, he was not a major figure, uh, but he did very well. But he came later, uh, and then finally, it finally did. It, I've recorded. I mean, I've written about how this all happened. Uh, Don Fag, myself, Hilly, and uh, Ed Ryan just got in. The, we had a car that was provided to us and just rode all over eastern Java, east central Java, trying to find a town that we could work in. We found one where there was a very fine local. The most, the key to anthropology work is who's in charge locally, as you know. I mean, if you get, if you could, especially in a place like Indonesia, if the district officer, a man named Odono, if, he's, if he wants you there and he's got, this guy was great, he was an old nationalist. He really thought this was a great idea that Americans would understand it. I mean, he had it all right. And he, he understood we wanted to live with families. He set it up. Uh, so he was, that's what made us decide to go there. There were some others that were, this were possible. Pare. Pare, this is Pare. Um, and, and he, they thought another two or 3,000 of you were coming shortly. No, that, that's just a rumor that's, I mean, no, I don't think the most of them did. But I had some, later when we talked, yes, uh, I, some people said, that, I think there's going to be a 1,000 of you. And I said, no, there's just five or six of us. And, you know, and then he did, we were distributed around the area, and we worked there for two years, uh, two and a half years. And uh, uh, so it all worked out well. Uh, we detached ourselves. We didn't have the students. That ended. There was a lot of bitterness. Felt. And the, the bitterness, they had right to feel some bitterness. We had, here they had been deceived. And so, not purposely, at least not by me. But um, so we just worked there. And, and we got on good relationships, eventually, with these three professors. And one of them, especially, was very supportive. Another one was also... Sort of. So it all worked out in the end, but it was extremely, when Rufus came, he went to see the culture minister, uh, uh, an Islamic medical figure who was an intense nationalist, who subjected Rufus to about three hours of bitter harangue about what the faithless Americans were like. But we had it coming in a way. I mean, we as a group, I didn't feel personally had it coming, but we as a group had it coming. And, uh, but then in the end, he said, oh, Essentially, fuck you, go ahead and do it. I mean, uh, in the Japanese version of that or whatever, go ahead. Don't bother me again. I don't want to hear of you. If you, if you, if anything happens to you, don't write me. Uh, and we went off, and it worked out beautifully. I mean, uh, the years there were run for us. Uh, and so it was the end. And then their relationship with Gajamata did smooth out. I mean, they became cordial. I, and I think, uh, again, looking back at the professors and, and, the, and, the, and the whole apparatus there, were just as relieved themselves. They all had gotten in too deep, into something they didn't understand. You've been back many times. Oh, many times, yeah. 
obviously, what is it about field work? I mean, do you do it because you know it's important to you, or do you do it because you enjoy it? Or I love it, yeah, I enjoy it. Well, it's important too, but I, yeah, at least I hope it's important. No, I've never been happier than in the field. And not all the time. It's you know, it's it's hell much of the time. But yeah, I liked it. Um, anthropologists lead a very oddly divided life. I guess part of it has a kind of self-proving thing. I would have not thought I was when I taught. Well, I'm going around circles, but when I taught later, you can't tell when you have students in class whether they're going to be good field workers or not. Some of the brightest can't do it. Some of the least impressive in class can, but it doesn't work that way either. I mean, there's just no correlation between classwork and fieldwork abilities. I mean, they, sometimes they go together, sometimes they're both bright in class and bright in the field, sometimes they're one or the other, but you cannot predict. I was never able to predict who would become field fielders, nor for myself. And I didn't think that I would be, but I found that I was good at it. Well, I feel I was good at it. I mean, never mind what the world thinks, but I think it was good at it. And uh, I... Uh, I liked it. I worked. It was. It's excruciating. It's, it's a tremendous amount of effort and work. But I've always been happier in the field than anywhere else. So you were that time. I think it was definitely one of the times. You were very, very ill. You yeah, were, almost died. Yeah. You, both of you very ill. Um, there were well, different times. Yeah, we both. War going on around you. Oh, that's later. Yeah. I mean, the conditions sound horrendous, and yet you still went back for more. Oh yeah. Well, that's. It goes with the territory. So, you know, I didn't. I didn't, uh, yeah, I did go up for more. The, uh, uh, that was later on. I was sick even the first time I almost died. I had uh, um, uh, pneumonia and, and um, almost died. I stayed in the hospital and, and joked you for several months. Um, and then later, yes, that was a day later trip. And I, that was about 10 years further on. I was in the middle of a war and I had topical malaria and also I couldn't see because they had given me a, a Kind of myopia, yeah, it was terrible. And Hilly was practically dying when she had uh, hepatitis. Mm. It turned yellow, and we were isolated in this place, and there was no doctors except one German doctor who had been on the Italian front. But uh, yeah, anyway, and we fled across, and so in that story's all that. I've told that story in the. In the do you not think in the middle of all that, I'm never going to do any more field work? No, in a minute, no. As soon as we got back, and then we got back there, and Hilly recovered, and I got. Well, I recovered first, and then we got more or less okay. They invaded us from the sky. You know, we were in an oil camp loan to, to American Oil Company. We went there because there was a hospital there, and she could be treated. Took a horrendous trip across the middle of Sumatra. And uh, we got invaded by paratroopers, and then we went, really went back to Bali. And finished out of, you know, the, we didn't go home. We went back another six, seven months to Bali. Um, it interrupted a program I had. I was going to go to Sulawesi and so on, but that was not possible. And I was going to work in Nankabra, and that wasn't possible either. But uh, no, and then I've been back, yes, as you said. And, and I worked, the, most of the work in Morocco came after that. <laughs> so uh, I've never right? thought about not going. I, I would like to go. No, I was, the last time I was back was about three years ago. Mm. I was back for only then, about uh, six weeks or something. But I went all over the place. And, and yeah, I still like it. I would do it if I thought I would survive. I'm not so sure I would survive now. I'm sure you would, but what, what is it? Is it curiosity? Is it uh, the relaxing of um, the, no, it's, the, the it's relations it's that you have in your own society? Many anthropologists find a great sense of relief. No, I, I mean, maybe do, but I, that, no, that isn't. It's, what it is is finding out about how what other, find out how people are really quite different than you are, what they're all about. I find that an tr absolutely intriguing thing to do, to figure out what the hell is going on with these people. What the hell is happening here? How this works? How it? Uh, and and the Japanese and and the Balinese and the Moroccans are to me endlessly intriguing. I mean, it's the kind of. I'm not, you know, I have a reputation of not being a, a very scientifically oriented. Probably, you know, I'm not a hard scientist type. But in that regard, I am. I really am very. I want to know what this. So I have the same kind of puzzlement that you know that a physicist would have about why some phenomena go about stars or something. I, mean, I want to understand them. My main motives are, are radically cognitive. Um, uh, I wouldn't put it that way because I don't like the idea of cognitive even that way, but, but they are to interpret and understand these. And I enjoy that. I enjoy just figuring them out and figuring out how to get along with them and figuring out how to live with them and figuring out what makes them tick. I just find that extraordinary. And, 
and being allowed to do it without anybody telling me how to do it. And that's the other thing you do have in the field. You're your own person, and you can do what you want. I mean, you, there are constraints, so millions of constraints, but they're not the constraints of professors and, mm. and courses. And, and so, and so uh, I, just have, I just find it endlessly fascinating. I find the Javanese and the Balinese and the Moroccans, the three groups I worked with, endlessly. I could spend the rest of my life just trying to figure out what the hell they're all about. Mm. Was that, I mean, you started in philosophy, Mm -hmm. so were there any larger questions? I mean, the earlier generations of anthropologists were trying to find out whether there was a common humanity or you know, very general questions um, about human nature and human progress and so on. Behind the curiosity of trying to find out what they were about and understanding them, were there some more general questions? You think? Well, you see in the phrase lecture I'm about to give, I come to talk about meaning a bit. And, but I really, yes, I was under asked general questions about how people construct meaningful lives, but I, I again, I'm a fox, not a hedgehog, so I don't think that there's a single kind of underlying, I've always been opposed, I've always been pluralist. I assume people really are different. I mean, not radically different, if they wouldn't, you could talk to each other. This is, I don't want to get the relativism of arguments, but I think people, I do really think Japanese are not just a different version of Americans. I mean, I, I think they're, they're very profoundly themselves, or Americans or Balinese. So I'm not looking for common humanity in that sense. Sure, there's common humanity. We're all human beings. But I'm looking for the specific, exp particular expressions of it. Again, I start off in literature. I'm interested in specific expressions. I'm interested in, in the, you know, when you study literature, you're not interested, well, at least I, the way I study it, you're not interested in some sort of general notion of what literature is. You're interested in, you know, Dickens and Shakespeare and Emily Dickinson and, in my case, and Hawthorne and people. What made the, what is specific and special and extraordinary about these people? So I'm more like that. So I'm not looking for some sort of abstract common humanity. I'm not denying people are human, and that's certainly true. But I'm more interested in, in the Javanese, of the, the Javanese of the Javanese and the Moroccanness of the Moroccan and the Americanness of myself. Uh, that's what concerns me, and I'm trying to puzzle it out. Uh, I'm interested in what people's ways of being in the world, to use the Heideggerian phrase, which is now, I think it's the right way to put it. I mean, I think that's what, or a form of life in Wittgenstein's sense. I'm interested in exactly, and I'm interested in those in a way in which uh, anyone interested in diversity, the way Darwin was into species or animals, about what they are really like. Now, it doesn't mean you don't want some general notions. I, I do. I try to make some, I've tried to make some general arguments. But I'm not, I'm not an enlightenment figure that's trying to figure out what, what people are like underneath it all. Mm. I want to find out what they're like within it all. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it does. Uh, what, uh, we'll come back to it, but just uh, mm. one last question along those lines. I mean, I think Edmund Leach and also Keith Thomas have both said that the only point of history or anthropology in those two cases is really as a mirror of your own society. In other words, it will tell you something about your own world and make you better in your own world. Um, not taking it to that extreme, do you, you, did you ever feel that it, this might also help you to understand America? Oh, it certainly helps you to understand yourself in America. I don't agree with that position, however. That, that's exactly what we're not supposed to be doing. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not studying Japanese in the service of understanding the United States. I'm studying the Japanese to understand the Japanese. Yeah. So I don't agree with, mm -hmm. Keith is a very good friend of mine, but I don't agree with that. Or Keith Hopkins or Keith Thomas? We'll get mixed Keith together. Thomas. Keith Thomas, yeah. Um, so I don't, I mean, I think it does, but I, I, I think we do really want to understand the other as the other, not as just a pale reflection of us or, or as a way of into our own selves. I, I think that's more narcissistic than I care to be, which doesn't mean you don't learn anything about the United States by being poor. Of course you do. It has changed my views of all kinds of things. But I went to Java and Morocco and Bali to understand Java and Morocco and Bali not to understand the United States.